So now we're going to take the long view. Um, so the title of this panel is Vision Industry 2020 to 2050. That's way in the future. And our panelists are uh, Rodney Brooks, Tom Kochman, and Andrew McAfee. And uh, why don't I give you the floor first, Rod? Oh, th thanks. Thanks, John. So um, I'm going to talk fairly briefly. Um, I want to start by saying, you know, we've heard a lot about AI today, and I, I think it's actually been a, a good meeting because people have been more realistic about the future of AI than in many meetings. But I want to say a few words about uh, the future of AI. Um, I think a lot of people uh, are confused about how powerful AI is right now, how many jobs it could take, what sort of jobs it could take, et cetera. Um, because they make some fundamental errors in understanding AI. We've heard about the word suitcase words today, and I, I think people have gotten very confused about what, uh, you know, I've had VCs say, but does your robot learn? Oh, it learns, that's great, it learns. But, you know, Andy and I both live in uh, Cambridgeport near, near here, and we both had to learn how to navigate around a maze of one-way streets, which is a very different experience from learning how to use chopsticks which is a very different experience from learning ancient Latin, which I once did. Um, but just because we've got one sort of machine learning doesn't mean we've got broad coverage of machine learning. A second thing I think people make mistakes about is that we have good models of when we hear a human performing some task, we know how to generalize that to what sort of competence they have, whereas we don't know that with AI algorithms. So Antonio was talk, showing pictures of people carrying umbrellas in the rain. Um, and out of those sorts of uh, training sets, you can expect Google or, or uh, you know, Fei-Fei Li from Stanford, now Google, uh, have their system look at an image of people and, and put, give it a label, people carrying umbrellas in the rain. Now, if a person does that, you would expect to be able to ask them, for instance, well, what does it mean in Japan when people are carrying umbrellas in the sun? What is rain? Do people get wet when it rains? Um, what are people? Can raccoons carry umbrellas? You'd expect a person to be able to answer all those questions, but these systems can't answer any of them. And the third thing I'll just say, I think people overestimate, and this gets to the topic of industry 2020, 2050, people overestimate how quickly top down ideas will trickle out into manufacturing. I was recently, oh, well, first of all, I'll tell you, uh, uh, because we just had a legal panel. In Europe, the legal standard for industrial equipment is under the machine directive. And according to the machine directive, any safety critical code in an industrial machine in Europe can neither use pointers nor stacks. <laughs> You're not allowed to use them. So this AI stuff, forget it. It isn't going to get there into those safety critical systems. Wow. Lastly, industry today is based on pro, uh, automation, it's based on programmable logic controllers, PLCs, invented in Bedford, Massachusetts in 1967. And what they do, PLCs, is emulate electromagnetic relays. You may remember them from early physics classes, a, an electromagnet pulling down a piece of metal and making a contact. They emulate those. And for a while, after 1967, they started emulating the 24-volt wires with an RS-486 character-based standard. Now it's an Ethernet-based standard. But the PLC manufacturers and people who build PLC systems now use an Ethernet cable as a one-for-one -one replacement for a 24-volt DC signal often. Uh, but under, underneath it, they're emulating electromagnetic relays. And even the Tesla factory in the Bay Area has today advertisements for PLC technicians. Wow. They're using emulated electromagnetic relays to build self-driving cars. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, I'm going to shift the debate, because I think that's what we're really here to do. And that is to ask, how can we gain some control over technology and the future of work so that we're all better off 20 years from now? And I believe that we've heard a lot about the, the need to be a more inclusive society, a need to use technology more effectively, but we haven't really yet engaged the strategies that need to be put in place to do so. 
So I'm going to suggest four things that I believe if we do these things, then in 20 or 30 years, and indeed uh, not even that long, we will all be better off. We will use technology more effectively, we will be more productive, and we will have better work with a whole variety of different jobs. And it starts by uh, uh, redefining who makes these decisions. Let's think about what problems we're trying to solve. Let me make it concrete. I think driverless cars are a silly idea. Who wants driverless cars? We want a safe, we want an efficient, we want a more accessible transportation system that augments in the, the, the work that humans do behind the wheel. And maybe that will eliminate them completely, but maybe it won't. And if we think about defining it from a societal standpoint, from the stakeholders who really have a stake in this, that is the users, maybe even the drivers, and I'll come to that in a moment, then we can start to think creatively about how to augment the technology and augment the work effectively. That's point number one. Point number two is we tend to think about technology and then we worry about the workforce. That's the wrong approach. That will never get this problem addressed. We need to integrate the design of work systems and the design of technology at the same time and make them simultaneous choices and decisions. Let me give you an example. In the, in the auto industry a long time ago, General Motors was getting uh, beaten up by Toyota, and they said, we'll solve that problem, we'll automate. We spent $50 billion at General Motors, and they still were the high-cost producer. Why? Because they didn't listen to the workforce about how to improve the operations, how to bring technology in, how to make those robotics and all the, the uh, advanced manufacturing processes really more efficient. Toyota took that approach, and they continued to have the highest productivity and the highest quality. That's an old example, but I've seen it in healthcare. I've seen it now in uh, the airline industry, where we overinvest because we don't let workers give wisdom to these machines. If we make that our second principle, I think we will make progress. The third is, you've heard a lot about training. Well, I do a lot of work on uh, workforce development. And one thing we, we've learned over the years is you have to train on a lifelong basis before the crisis. Those same auto workers who were trained to engage in quality control and in teamwork, flexible work systems, a design of a work system that made sense, could then integrate that technology effectively and really make it sing to produce high quality cars at low cost. But they couldn't do it under stress by seeing the technology coming in and then thinking they're going to get displaced. It's too late to retrain at that stage. We need to train on a lifelong basis, and that means we in universities and in community colleges in industry have to do our part to make sure that the training is, is preparing people to participate in this process. And then finally, we are going to have some people displaced. We are going to lose some jobs. There's no question that's the history of technological change. We may lose more now. I don't care about these predictions about how fast or who's going to uh, win the race, are we going to create more or lose more jobs, that's a crapshoot. That's the wrong question. The question are, is, what are we going to do to help those people who are effective? And you heard a number of suggestions about that already. We have to compensate people for the losses. We have to help them make the adjustments. Frankly, I don't think our society can afford another episode of a big gap between winners and losers like we're experiencing the consequences of right now. If we deal fairly with those people who are, uh, who are affected negatively, then I think we will make progress. If we follow these four principles and start now, we will control the future of technology in a way that does produce a more shared prosperity and reduce some of the, the problems that we're experiencing right now. If we let it to the technologists alone, will replicate the winners and the losers. Hi, all. Uh, first of all, thank you for hanging in here for what has been a fantastic day, but a long one. The good news is that this is the last participant monologue that you're going to have to listen to today. Uh, I want to take advantage of this panel about industry 2020 to 2050 to uh, tell you what the three most common questions I hear are about the future of industries, the future of economies, the future of competition, and what my personal answers to those are. The, the first question that I hear a lot is, has our economy been hijacked? 
You can look at the gap between rich and poor. You can look at the fact that we've got these really powerful dominant companies. You can look at the fact that some people are just doing just extraordinarily well. And there's a line of thought out there that says our economy has been hijacked. It's been taken over by the financiers. Uh, it's been financialized. And, and, and we got to take our economy back. There's probably more than none of that going on. But I think what's going on is that our economy is just changing. It's going through structural transformation brought on by the tectonic forces of tech progress and globalization. And that does a good job of accounting for all, I think, most if not all of the changes that we're seeing. For example, it is the case that more and more industries are becoming more and more concentrated in the US. It's also the case that most industries are becoming more and more concentrated around the world. And if the phenomenon that we're seeing is a global phenomenon, it's a little harder for me to believe that the plutocrats have hijacked every economy around the world. So I'm much more on the side of structural change as opposed to hijacking of the economy. The second question that I get asked a lot is, do, uh, do, we, do we need to worry about these great big, especially technology monopolies? Have we finally created permanent tech monopolies. And my prediction on that is almost certainly not. My career is long enough to remember when we were worried about IBM as a permanent tech monopoly. Uh, I was I certainly uh, been around long enough to know talking about Microsoft as a permanent tech monopoly. We were worried about AOL, remember that one, as a permanent tech monopoly. Ten years ago, it looked like the worldwide phone industry had been sewed up by a Finnish company, Nokia, and a Canadian one, Research in Motion. So the, f the pattern that we just keep seeing is dominance, really powerful companies come along, uh, take advantage of big markets and technology, but then disruption, something unseats them. And the question confronting us these days is, is this time finally different? Are the Googles, Amazons, Facebooks, uh, and Apples of the world categorically different? The only honest answer is nobody knows. But I think there's a lot of reason to be cautious about that. The fact that I can't identify what's going to unseat those companies doesn't tell me a thing. I couldn't have identified what was going to unseat the previous generation of company. So I'm a, I'm a lot less worried about these, you know, the, the idea that we might have a permanent class of technology monopolies. We should also keep in mind that we, we're hearing a lot right now about bringing antitrust actions against these companies because some people feel they're too big and too powerful. Uh, the, the job of antitrust is not to protect small companies from big ones, and it is not to protect a company from becoming not to protect us from companies becoming too dominant. That's just not what that law is there for. So I get really, really nervous when people talk about taking that antitrust hammer out of the toolkit and going to whack companies with it. The third question that I get asked all the time is, are there going to be jobs in the industries of the future? And the answer to that is yes, but there is no guarantee that there will be as many jobs in those industries of the future as, they, as there are today. I hear a lot, and I've heard a couple times today, that we always benefit from bringing together minds and machines. And there's kind of a, either an implicit or an explicit follow-on to that, which is, therefore, we're always going to need more people to do jobs. That is flat not correct, and history shows us that that's not correct. There are many fewer longshoremen, for example, in America today than there were half a century ago. That's a job that has just shrunk in the face of tech progress. The year of peak manufacturing employment in America was 1979. We manufacture a lot more stuff than we did in 1979. We do it with many, many fewer people. So there's just no iron law that says that employment goes up as tech progress continues. We don't know what's going to happen over the course of the next three decades. We are still going to have some jobs around, but they're going to be fairly different. And in some cases, they're going to be less in number than the ones we have today. Went a little bit over. Damn. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. So as a reporter in Silicon Valley, I used to sort of divide the world into now to three years into the future, which was product planning. And anything beyond that was science fiction. There was a lot of science fiction, um, which sort of puts me, I think, a, a bit in Rod's camp. But I, I wanted to start by asking the three of you to, to respond to Kaifu today at lunch, where he gave a pretty re relentlessly optimistic and perhaps pes pessimistic in other ways view of the rate of progress of this field of AI. Could, I mean, are, are you on board? To what extent are you guys on? Well, and the, the second part of that question, it also uh, was evocative to me, and just in the sense that it had on, on the audience, of, I, I, I'm, I'm sure, I guess you're all old enough to remember the Japanese fifth generation and what a potential threat it was to our computer industry. So could, could you respond to what, what Kaifu said today, if you, if, you, if you heard it? Let's ask the AI guy first. Well, uh, f first, 
you know, remember, Kaifu has got his venture capital fund in China. His job is to be optimistic. <laughs> um, um, and remember that there are a, a lot of people in China, a, a vast number of people in China. And uh, the metrics he pointed out, you know, you know are going up in China. Um, I was, uh, I don't know whether Kaifu's still here or not, but I was, uh, you know, a little taken aback by some, many of the things he talked about. Well, we, we give up privacy in China. We give up this, we give up that. At least in the US, we'd like to believe we don't give up privacy. That may not be true, but uh, we like to believe we don't. Um, uh, I, I, so I, the, there is a tremendous amount, oh, and, and he also very conveniently uh, sort of skipped over um, uh, ripping off IP, where he said, well, we weren't ripping off IP, no, 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 uh, but we learned how to do things. The Chinese companies do learn how to do things. Uh, I, I've spent many hours in the last month being, in, in being deposed by lawyers over a IP, total IP ripoff. I mean, down to the point of stealing uh, tooling for physical devices in China. So there's a lot of lawless, lawlessness there too, which, um, the, and the barrier around that is that uh, uh, U.S. companies and European companies can only fight back by, by fighting on the edges as it comes out of China. Mm. So he view, has a very rosy view. I, I have a, a much um, more sanguine view of, of what's going on. Uh, there is, there is a, a battle going on. There is a fight. And the U.S. for the last... I don't know how many decades it says, we don't do industrial policy here. Uh, China does industrial policy with daggers out. And uh, that says where, that tells you where it's going to go long term. Tom, did you have a? Well, let me, uh, uh, Rodney uh, has to fight the IP battles. I got thrown out of China for uh, trying to teach about conflict management at the workplace. And, and the, experience, the Chinese authorities didn't, didn't thought we were creating the conflict, I guess. But in any event, the, the, the point here is if we have the right institutions and policies, we can let AI evolve at its own natural pace. But I think to reinforce what Rod just said, the difference between China, which uh, doesn't want to re uh, recognize any democratic rights and wants to suppress all of the the different voices and the different institutions. The rest of the world largely is, is a, a world where people can express ideas, can have a voice in shaping things like technology, can have a voice in shaping what problems it's going to resolve. And if we have institutions that allow people to engage with AI and bring the different stakeholders together so that the technologists talk to the, to, to the social scientists and so that the CEOs talk to their workers and talk to their customers and hear about uh, the real needs in their communities, then we will shape AI and I think we will probably even maybe accelerate. I can't say accelerate the technological frontier, but accelerate the acceptance of it and the use of it to address big problems in society. That's the vision that I think is available to us and that's why it's, it's so great to be in an environment where people are now recognizing that. That's what this conference is all about. How do we get some, uh, some control over the use of it? I don't mean limiting it, regulating it, discouraging it, channeling it in its most productive ways. The What's impression that I get when I listen to people at events like this, when I talk to folk like Rob, is that we're, we're getting really good, and I don't know if exponential is the right adjective or not, but we're making very fast progress on some pretty long-standing, pretty well-defined problems in the domain of artificial intelligence. Recognize images, understand human speech, play Go at a high level. Uh, the fact that we're making progress on all those, to me, is existentially insignificant. And I, one of the, it, it pains me to agree categorically with Rod Brooks, um, but, but one, of the, one of the areas where he and I are in violent agreement is that this, the silliness around the singularity is exactly that, it's just silly. But these, the progress that we're making is clearly economically significant. And the fact that most of the time when I talk to my phone these days, there is no other person there, and I'm not insane, I'm actually dictating at, at, with very, very high accuracy rates, that's, ec that's already economically significant. It's going to be much more economically significant. There are a lot of people whose job it is to listen to what another person wants and try to give that to them. Those jobs are going to be confronted by a lot more automation very quickly. Yeah. Understood. 
understood. So um, we're at this juncture. I mean, none of you are semiconductor guys, but let me pose a, 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 a situation. We've lived off of Moore's law for five or six decades. There's now an active debate in Silicon Valley of, over whether Moore's law is in abeyance at this point. And you know, the most interesting, there's all kinds of data you can cite, but there is a school of thought that the cost per transistor has stopped falling, and it hasn't fallen for a long time. Intel hasn't turned the crank in TikTok for a while. So if, in fact, um, the AI revolution has been riding on this free ride of you know, falling cost of computing and some good ideas from the 1980s, and all of a sudden we're at a plateau, how, how, how would it look different? Yeah, uh, Silicon Valley in, gen in general, not just AI, has been riding on Moore's law. And Moore's law fundamentally works on the idea that, um, you know, is, is there a sea sale cup on the table? Take away half of them. Is there a seek sale cup on the table? The answer is still the same. It's only when you get down to <laughs> one or about 20 atoms, which is where we are now in the silicon uh, size, that it, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so Moore's law is coming to an end from what is classically driven. I happen to think that that's the greatest thing that's happened to computer architecture for 50 years. Because <laughs> for 50 years, everyone knew exactly what was going to happen two years, four years from now, and they couldn't afford to experiment. Now you see new players like NVIDIA yeah. with different architectures coming about, being driven by AI problems, because they, they don't have to go lockstep in that old design. Uh, Although I have to tell you a story at this juncture that I think is hilarious. There is a company um, that is a competitor to NVIDIA, and this is the notion of these new architecture of new problems. It's called GraphCore. And um, GraphCore is in Bristol, and people I know who've looked at it have gone, holy shit, this is just like the CM1. Um, so, I mean, we're, we may still be making progress off of old architectures. They were just too, too early. But I think you've already answered your own question. We're seeing really recent examples of what I think are a pretty striking process at the same time when, if you're right, Intel has not been able to increase the, the, the cost per you know, transistor of its chips. So we're, we're in this fallow period at that level and in a very exciting period at another level. I, I have a lot of faith that the, that the different geeks around the Moore's Law industries are going to keep innovating whether or not they do it at the, at the coffee cup level in ways that are going to continue to give us all kinds of amazing progress. So you know, we're talking, if we're, if we're talking a, a decade to three decades out, how much are we at the mercy of Hollywood in terms of shaping our views of the way tech? Now, I, I mean, I believe Rod Brooks once told me that you got into this business after seeing a Hollywood movie. Isn't that sort of proof of the fact that it does have a, a, an effect on the world? I can't tell you how many people I've run into who saw the movie Space Odyssey and decided to go into AI. I believe Rod is. Well, I was, I, w I was already trying to build intelligent machines, but uh, 2001. Uh, I was 13 years old or something, validated for me that there was stuff out there, and I just fell in love with how, you know, it was a murdering psychopath, but <laughs> it, was, it was great. You weren't alone. There were, you know, it was yeah. a generation of young men. But, but, I, mean, but I, think, I think Hollywood movies, I think Hollywood movie style thinking leads us astray, and, and Hollywood movie style thinking says we've got the world just as it is, and we put some super technology <laughs> in it. But super technology in real life doesn't come from nothing, it gradually builds up, and, and so you learn about the technology and adapt to it along the way. And a lot of the Hollywood movie plots are, we haven't adapted to technology, which apart from aliens arriving, doesn't really make sense. So, Andrew, technology versus culture, I mean, what, what's driving us? I mean, is it, is it, I mean, is it interactive or? Yeah, sure, it's always interactive. I'm a lot more worried about prominent voices outside Hollywood scaremongering and fear-mongering than I am. Hollywood's job is to tell us really compelling stories. These prominent voices, I, I, I would wish that they would be a little more grounded or reasoned about some of the things that they're saying. Now, are you, without naming names, are you talking about Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates? Those are names. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, it's, so it's, it's technologists. It's, it's, it's actually the community that you're worried about. No, none of those three is an AI researcher. The, when, and when I talk to AI researchers, not just Rod Brooks, I'm yeah. going to channel Andrew Ng here, yeah. who has made a lot of the advances in the field. He's had a front, not just front row seat, he's been on the pitch. He says worrying about, about big, scary AI and killer robots is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. We are spending w way too much time on this sophomore dorm room BS topic. <laughs> Did I say that strongly enough? 
Elon also said that he wanted to die on Mars, just not on impact, which I thought was one of his. <laughs> like, like, let let rich go. guys go spend their money to colonize Mars. Awesome, go do that. Just stop with the killer robots. Yeah. yeah. Well, so is there, <laughs> it's getting late in the day. We're, I mean, we're just letting loose. You, you also seem to have a, a grounded sense. Why does this field tend to overpromise? Do you have a sense of what? what well, we all, we, all technology is overpromise. That's the history of technology. Mm. Uh, that's why people get afraid of it, and, and we, we fantasize about it, and we have movies about it, and we uh, popularize it. But when you look at how it's being used on the ground, and you look at how people are embracing it uh, as users of technology, that's where the innovation, the continuous innovation comes from. And so I'm much more uh, interested in seeing how we can bring more people into the discussion of how we use technology so that we, it both shares the benefits, but so that we get its full utilization. We've seen way too many technologies take too long to diffuse. I mean, that's been the history from the Industrial Revolution. It took a long time for uh, us to make, uh, figure out that mass production could actually use all of this new energy that was available. But if you start to bring the workforce in, you start to bring the users in, they begin to see the value of, of the, the innovations and the inventions, and they create new opportunities. That's how uh, our laptops have freed up many of us up to do some parts of our work and other people to do uh, uh, some of the work. But then we see all kinds of new applications and new innovations and new developments, particularly from young people. So I would look not to the Elon Musks and those characters. Yeah, they're important. I would look to the next generation. If we educate them to be facile with the use of technology and to give them the opportunities to be creative, that's where the, the, the real value, and that's where we'll see the diffusion and the, and the better utilization of, of all this wonderful stuff. And I'd like to build on what Tom just said there. Way. I, I left my uh, uh, smartphone behind stage. But how many people, you know, have to go and take a course on how to use a smartphone. Right. Smartphones teach you how to use them. Right. They come in at just the level where most people are, and then they teach you how to use them. And so people are using these powerful machines without having to do training, which is exactly the opposite of, of how people in, in industrial equipment think about, it. oh, this is a complicated machine, there's going to have to be training. I think that you know, we should look for those models where the machines teach the users and teach the people how to be uh, how to make use of them and, 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 use, and be more productive. And, and that's that getting that blending of people and machines by being open to the user, to the factory floor user, being open to it and encouraging it is the way that we're going to make go, progress. Go, go to the Midwest where there are a lot of uh, people who, who worked in industry and who came off farms, and you'll find in every garage a bunch of tinkerers people who will take machinery and they'll fix it and they'll modify it and they'll make it a more fancy motorcycle, maybe a more yep. powerful one, or they'll find new uses for all of this stuff, or they'll create what some people are now talking about, fab labs, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a, a very decentralized manufacturing. They'll use old technology to match with, with new technology because they, they're very practical. That's the kind of innovative spirit that we haven't fully tapped yet. And I think uh, if we learn to tap that kind of spirit from people who, who have practical problems to solve and see this stuff, whether it's a smartphone or an AI system or, or some robotics or, or advanced manufacturing, that's where the growth and that's where yeah. the creativity comes from. And, 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 and partially that requires a cultural change in some of the companies. So uh, I'm putting robots in factories that are meant for ordinary factory workers to be able to train for tasks. Some companies want to put passwords on them so, they, ah. so the factory workers can't ah. touch them yeah. instead of encouraging other, other companies, smaller companies, tend to say, who, who wants to be in charge? And right. someone steps up who's never, who does, maybe only has a high school education, yeah steps up, becomes in charge, and becomes the expert. And that's a change in how you, so do you think, think about it. Those two different cultures, do you, do you understand why one, one might be one side of that, that divide and the other and the other? Is there an easy explanation for no, why they no take No easy explanation. Okay. Just listen to them. Give them some power. 
workers have been beaten down in this society, both economically, as we've seen with the numbers, and we all have, have those same numbers, but our institutions, we don't have a voice at work anymore. What used to be unions are essentially powerless today. So we've got to create the next generation of opportunities for workers to have a voice. And I don't mean necessarily in the old ways, but to, to listen to the workforce and listen to the, the, the communities and listen to the spouses who have a problem in their house that they want fixed. And the husband who might have some skills will, will then figure it out. Yeah. Wait, I'll go ahead. And maybe both ways. Maybe yeah. both ways. That's right. I'm sorry. Well, one of the interesting distinctions that, that Eric and I came across when we were writing our book was between companies where management, where the formal hierarchy of the company, thinks that one of their really important jobs is to gatekeep the good ideas and to be the guardians or the, 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 the judges of what's a good idea or not. When we talk to companies, the ones that I really respect, uh, I, we saw over and over again managers trying hard to get out of that business and doing things like giving not putting passwords on Baxter's and giving people access to stuff and trying to, you know, for example, say, okay, that might be a good idea. Can you go run an experiment and give that back to me? My job is not to, like, arbitrarily assess your idea and tell you whether or not you can go ahead with it. And that, that shift is, um, is it, I think it's in its early stages. I think most managers have come up in a world where they think their job is to pass judgment on ideas that come up the hierarchy. I think it's going to be a sharp differentiator between successful companies and unsuccessful ones. So to, to your point about sort of re-enfranchising workers, um, if increasingly people are coming to the, to the workplace through these what, what are called talent platforms, these things, oh. these systems that hire people through the, the, the right. Ubers and the what have you, I mean, can you see a way forward where workers can participate in a more meaningful way when they're, when they're actually being atomized? Well, well I think that's a big problem. We've separated, you know, it used to be if somebody in Los Angeles had a job opening, they put an ad in the Los Angeles Times and somebody came and they went to work. Well, obviously those days are over. You have all these intermediary staffing organizations and we've got a project with a PhD student that shows the number of different organizations that touch the, the person before she or he ever gets hired. That's a travesty because that's productivity lost. But, uh, but let me give you the concrete example of how we can use uh, these platforms and, and, and benefit from them and how workers are benefiting. Do the experiment, those of you who live here in Boston, do the experiment and, and go on, uh, and, uh, you've got your Uber app, there's something called Fasten, like Fasten Your Seatbelt, a competitor. Get, go on, get the Fasten, I don't have any stock, I don't have any <laughs> stake in this, get Fasten's app, use it sometime, ask the driver, they all have Uber, Lyft, and Fasten on their phones, what's the difference? They all have the same technology, exactly the same, the same little car tells you two minutes, three minutes, whatever it is before they're going to pick you up, and so on. It, it, but the drivers will tell you they respect us. We earn more money with Fasten than we do with Uber. Uber has the customers, so we've got to stay with them. But the same technology, they've listened to the drivers. This is what, when a driver has a problem with a customer or a customer has a problem with the driver, they listen to both parties. They don't just blame the driver or drop the driver. They, they pay the driver a higher fee rather than, than what Uber does. There's a whole system of involving the workforce to, that gets loyalty. And I've done the careful research. I've probably talked to 10 of them now uh, or so. And they all say the same thing. We, we, we like working for Fast and More. We just wish they had more customers. So we can use this same technology, exactly the same, to either drive down the, the workforce and maybe serve customers better. Uber does a pretty good job of that. Or we can use that same technology to empower the drivers, treat them better, have more loyalty, and serve the customers just as well. Okay. A, a last question. I think I was surprised it didn't come up more today. But I, you know, there, there's there's a debate on jobs. I think there's more of a consensus on growing inequality in our in our society. And I was wondering if if you had a view on whether technology was the culprit and to what, to what degree technology is playing a role in, in driving us toward more economic inequality. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, are you asking us if technology is increasing inequality? I am. What's Mark Zuckerberg's net worth? <laughs> well, uh, okay. Well, well, that, well, my, my, answer, my, hold on, hold on. my answer is 
Yes. But is that, is that's, that, and is that's that a the, technology question? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but, but yes, 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 yes. Yeah. But that's the wrong thing to focus on. I, I'm not bothered about Mark Zuckerberg's net worth. It's a, I'm worried about the stagnation of the middle class. Uh, we, we, we are having a discussion about inequality, which is a somewhat important discussion. We are missing the bigger point, which is that, that, that people have stalled out and we have bad stagnation in our city. Those two are not the same problem. We are focusing on the wrong one. So, but the, the stagnation in wages, technology has had an impact with skill bias, technological change. No question about that. But it's a minor piece. It's a piece, and it was more important in, actually in the 1980s than in the last two decades. That's the empirical evidence. The other aspects that, that, that stag lead to stagnating wages are uh, globalization, especially in the last decade with China in the, in the World Trade Organization, so that's a piece. Technology and globalization can't be separated anymore. They're, they're uh, interacting. So those two are there. But the, the other big thing that has driven inequality and stagnant wages is the decline of our institutions. We have kept the minimum wage at the national level very low. We have destroyed unions. Unions had bargaining power. We have studied this for years. After 1980, they lost that bargaining power. They've gone down. And that accounts for about 20% of the growth in inequality or stagnation of wages since 1980. So we can deal with these issues, but we've got to have the right set of policies and the right set of institutions. No, we can't bring unions back in their old image exactly, but we can build the next generation of worker institutions that can add value to the economy and then negotiate for their fair share of the distribution of, of what they help to achieve. And yes, we need to, to raise the standards so that we put more pressure on firms to invest in sensible technologies to be more productive. So the inequality or the stagnant wages, they're, they're twins, essentially, are, 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 don't worry about the Zuckerberg, I agree. I don't care about him. I do care about the middle class, what we used to have the middle class, lower wage workers. We can address those issues and we can use technology to help advance their economic welfare if we're smart about it and if we're willing to make the tough political decisions and, and to bring the workforces, I'm, I'm a little redundant on this, but bring the workforces voice into this process, they will do better than they have in the past. Great, let's stop there. I think we're halfway there today. I think we're gonna get more of an economic prism tomorrow, but I wanted to thank yeah. the three of you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, John. Thank you very much.